We feel nation tsunami human. Welcome back to the show. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. Um, very excited. Got another great guest for you today. Uh, he is a supervising sound editor. Uh, for Warner Brothers. Um, he has over 20 years of experience in the industry. Um, he's worked on most recently uh, really major productions such as Minx, which is currently uh, streaming on HBO Max, um, You, which is currently on Netflix, uh, The Flash, Riverdale, um, and then has also done some filmmaking uh, for some uh, independent feature films. So I am excited to have him here. I'm excited to talk to him and get to connect with him today. Uh, please welcome to the show, Ethan Beagle. Ethan, thank you so much for spending some time with us today. Thank you. Um, Ethan, man, you, I just want to jump right into it, man. You've had a, a, a long time in the industry, a lot of cool opportunities. Um, tell us a little bit how you first got started and got into the industry. Um. Well, for sound specifically, I went to I went to NYU for film school. Mm -hmm. uh, so, the goal from pretty early on was always to get into filmmaking of some form. Um, when I was in film school, I was, and of course, I went to be a producer because, or no, I'm sorry, I went to be a director because everybody wants to direct. I eventually gravitated towards producing uh, over the course of my undergrad um, studies. And when I was producing, I realized that nobody really knew how to do post-production sound. Um, I thought it was a very underserved area. Um, and really, I was producing a couple of short films, and I didn't know anything about it. I didn't know how to schedule or budget or all the things that a producer should probably know. Uh, so I took the classes uh, while I was at NYU, and I really enjoyed it. I felt like it really connected with my personality. Um, and also because it was so underserved, it seemed like a pretty great way to get in to the industry um, because I thought there was a big demand for post-production sound people. Um, so after college, um, I was actually working for a short film distribution company um, you know, I had interned at a couple of sound places, but I wasn't able to break in. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was working for a post-production, or I was working for a short film distribution company. Um, it was a dot com and it was during the dot com boom and then crash. And so everybody got laid off because that was just kind of what happened. And, um, I had actually saved up my money and bought my own sound editing system so that I could keep practicing. Uh, cause I really wanted to do sound. The, the distribution thing was kind of just the job that I was able to get. Um, and I was unemployed and I was on the New York city subway and I heard a saxophone player, uh, on the subway and I played saxophone in high school. Uh, so I went over to listen to him and it turned out that the saxophone player on the subway was my sound design teacher at NYU. Oh, wow. And um, so I approached him. I started talking to him and I said, look, you know, I just bought Pro Tools. Uh, I really want to get into sound. Uh, any students that you know of uh, who have productions that need sound work, I, I would love to get a shot at it. Well, it turns out like the day or two before this meeting, uh, the studio that my teacher worked at had a job opening come up. So he just said, we might actually have something for you at Sound Dimensions where I work. So give me a call tomorrow and uh, let me see if I can get you a meeting. And I made the call. I had an interview on Friday and the next Monday I started my first paid job as a professional sound person. Um, and then it's kind of all been up from there. Yeah, uh, that's awesome. I love that. That's so cool. Uh, you never know right? <laughs> um. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely, my career has definitely had a lot of just sort of serendipitous um, moments where, you know, a door opened a crack and I just sort of like saw that little sliver of light and blew through it. And I, I mean, I'd be lying if I didn't say there was a, a healthy amount of luck and good timing mm -hmm. um, at multiple stages of my career uh, that have really benefited me. Um, with that too, Ethan, uh, it sounds like, are you originally from New York? No, I'm actually originally from, 
uh, the suburbs of Chicago, uh, John Hughes territory is where I grew up. Oh, wow. Um, so there was a rich uh, movie connection just from that because John Hughes went to my high school and it's featured in, you know, The Breakfast Club and, and all those movies growing up that I used to watch. Um, so there was definitely a, um, an excitement there. Yeah. Um, so, wow. So super cool. So you've been in all the major cities. Uh, tell us a little bit about how did you make your way over here to L.A.? Uh, so at the time that I was working in New York, I took the sound dimensions job and, um, I, I worked there for about five years. Uh, and what I realized as we were going, the independent film community had started to change, uh, cause it was right around the time that DV filmmaking was starting, mm -hmm. um, People were getting away from shooting on film and uh, the budgets of the movies that we were doing were going from, you know, million dollar movies to hundred thousand dollar movies. Mm -hmm. And proportionally, the budgets for the sound jobs were plummeting and it was becoming very, very difficult to, you know, survive uh, and get enough movies to make a decent living. Um and also at the time, the New York community was relatively small. I had some connections. Um, you know, my first internship was at a, an amazing editorial facility called C5. They had done all the Coen Brothers movies at that point. Uh, I think when I was interning there, they were doing Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, and Shaft, and Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? Um, so some, like, really great movies. But getting a job in those places was extremely difficult because the people who have those jobs don't ever leave them. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I felt like I was hitting a ceiling, um, and I wasn't really going to break through. Um, so I started investigating what a move to Los Angeles would look like. Um, I had just started dating, uh, who's now my wife, uh, and she was a native Los Angeles. Uh, she grew up out here. Uh, went to was in grad school at Columbia, which is how I met her in New York. Um, and so it started to seem like, you know, moving to L.A. should probably be a decent thing to do. There seems to be a lot more opportunity out here at the time. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, that's what I did. I got um, I got a directory of every sound facility uh, in Los Angeles and I called them one by one uh, until somebody called me back and said, we'd like to meet you. Uh, that's the way to do it, man. <laughs> I love that. Uh, I can definitely relate. I'm originally from uh, Richmond, Virginia myself. And um, yeah, it's just a lot more uh, opportunity. Even today, uh, things just going on out here. Um, yeah, what I realized, what I thought was interesting, and I didn't realize it until I got out here, um, was how diverse the industry really is. Mm -hmm. um, and what I mean is in New York, as a sound person, you could do independent movies or you could do advertising. And there wasn't a whole lot of anything else. Mm -hmm. um, but out here, the company that I got my first job at, it's a company called Novastar. Uh, they, up until the time that I got hired, uh, they were primarily a restoration facility. Uh, so they had all these deals with the studios where they would get these old TV shows and old movies and they would do five, one mixes of them. They would restore and do a lot of denoising because all these things were old and coming off of celluloid. Um, and, uh, that was primarily their business. So it was like, Oh, so I could have a job out here that's exclusively restoring audio, or I could have a job that's exclusively recording DVD commentary, which, isn't really a thing as much anymore. But at the time that was a really big deal. There were companies that specialized just in that. Mm -hmm. um, there are companies that specialize just in English versions of foreign language movies, you know, like there was so much diversity in LA in very, in a very centralized location that when I got out here, it was kind of like, Oh, I could really get into doing kind of anything. Mm -hmm. um, and that was really appealing. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, yes, I, I totally agree. Uh, just thinking about that, um, jumping around here, um, you've had the opportunity, you just had the opportunity to work on the show Minx. Um, I just <laughs> finished uh, the whole season because um, actually my acting teacher was in that show uh, very briefly. And uh, 
that that's a super cool show but talk about like how to what what is the process of working on something like that versus say a show like you uh both very different types of shows um one minx being a comedy with kind of a dark undertone and serious tones to it uh to bring some things to light and then you uh more of like a more of like a romantic um horror uh series if you will so yeah just talk about a little bit uh, like what was it like working on those um i mean they're both great uh mm-hmm. you know it's one of the great things about being in this industry is the variety of projects that we get to work on mm-hmm. and um i think that um you know so much stems from so much of the enjoyment and uh and the creativity stems from the top down and both those shows um you know minx is run by uh a woman named alan rapaport and uh you is run by a woman named sarah gamble and they both allow an extremely flexible amount of creativity from the crew on down so um you know they're not they're not they kind of sit over your shoulder uh and tell you what button to push people mm-hmm. which is great so um in terms of like the, the the differences um you know the approach is mentally largely the same the um we i evaluate the mood the show in the same sort of the same process i get the show i watch it um i take notes as to what i think the story demands um i'll talk to the the filmmakers in this case the executive producers or uh the writers and editors um and we'll get their ideas i'll throw out some of my ideas for how we think the movie the show i keep saying movie because sorry (laughs) i still feel like i'm in movie land um and then we uh then I assemble my team and I sort of filter those creative discussions down to them and we start attacking it piece by piece. Um, so in terms of our process, we do the same process on both, regardless of whether or not it's a comedy or a drama or a horror mm-hmm. show or whatever. Um, what we curate for the show is obviously very different. Mm -hmm. Um, So you, for example, is a very, um, it's a very personal uh, story. Everything is, is really coming out of our main character, Joe's head. You know, there's this running voiceover through the whole thing and everything is very dominant from his specific point of view. Uh, so we choose sounds accordingly. Um, you know, we don't play things that he might not hear. We keep things a little bit tighter. Um, it's not as, um, not as busy or as active around him because we're always going to end up going back into his head, you know, within a few seconds of anything happening. So we want to be able to make sure that that, comes out uh in the forefront uh on a show like minx which is uh more of a workplace comedy um we curate the sounds to play up the activity um and to add excitement in the backgrounds uh and to really make this the workplace alive uh as much as we possibly can it's more about that show is much more about the interactions between characters and their environment uh than where you is much more interaction of our character in his own head, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, super cool. Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, It's always interesting to learn about, you know, how these things come to life. Um, And speaking of that, uh, tell us a little bit about, um, you said you had more of, you had a lot of free range uh, to be creative on both projects. Um, How often are you able to collaborate with the writers, with the directors, with um, the actors, uh, in order to bring something like this to life? Or is it just more so just you and your team? Um, So as the supervising sound editor, I am the go-between between between my team and the the clients, the creatives. Mm -hmm. Um, So there is a decent amount of interaction. Now, on a TV show, um, we have to move pretty quickly. Uh, So... There isn't as much as you would find on a movie. Um, 
you know, for an episode, for example, an episode of you, which is about a 50 minute long show, uh, we get about seven days to put it all together before we have to mix it and play it back for the executives. Um, on a movie, that process might be seven weeks. Mm -hmm. Uh, so really, um, we have our meeting at the beginning, our, what we call a spotting session where we sit down and we watch the show and we talk about it. Uh, and we talk about those things more conceptually. Um, you know, in this scene, we want to feel this way, uh, in this scene we're, we're, we're really trying to, the story we're trying to tell in this scene is this. And, um, and then I relay that feeling that we want to have to my team. And if there's any questions that come up, then I will go back, uh, and talk to the producers, um, or any challenges or problems that, that might arise. But ultimately the producers don't usually hear what we did, uh, until we get to the mixing part of the process where we take all of the material that my team has collected and organized and created, and we give it to our mixers who then balance it out and turn it into a show that you would actually want to listen to. Um, and then the producers then will give us notes, uh, based on what they're hearing and we will make changes and adjustments, uh, at that point. Um, in between there, I do work with the actors all the time. Um, we do a lot of voice re-recording. Um, on you, of course, there's the, the voiceover, which is such a huge part of the show. So I'm usually present for those sessions where we're recording that. Um, so there is a lot of give and take with the actors of trying to make sure that their performance is what they want it to be and what they the story they want to tell. Um, yeah, on a feature, it's a little bit different because you have the time, you know, we bring in the filmmakers more frequently, uh, as we have things to show them and we're doing a lot of revisions ahead of the mix so that when we get there, um, ideally we're playing around with how these sounds play rather than what sounds we play on TV. We don't really get that luxury. So, um, they kind of have to trust me that I'm going to give them the sounds that are going to work for the show. Yeah, no, um, all really interesting. Very cool. And I mean, that's good to know, um, said if anybody ever gets into the industry to know, you know, the, uh, relationships, the types of people and the things you'll be doing. Um, I was going to say with that too, Ethan, we were talking really quick before, uh, we started, um, you mentioned you play Dungeons and Dragons. And um, I, I played too. Um, I used to. Uh, I had a good group going and we played for, I guess, about six or eight months. Um, does Is that something that just keeps you creative and keeps you inspired or does that bleed over into uh, your daily process? Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. I actually, you know, I only really restarted during the pandemic. My kid uh, was kind of interested in it. Um big fantasy lover mm -hmm. uh and you know had heard about D D, and i hadn't played since i was like 12 or 13 mm -hmm. um and i actually remember it not being the greatest experience when i was a kid um and so i was a little hesitant about running the game mm -hmm. for my daughter um so but i got it and thank god there's the internet and i watched a bunch of streamers and sort of saw how the game works again and what the dungeon master does and and you know to answer your question yeah it really keeps you on your toes creatively um and i think uh you know it's not something that i necessarily need because i do work in a creative field and i so like my creative urges i'm able to you know deal with on a daily basis mm -hmm. uh but it is in terms of being a storyteller it's a great way to hone your craft um because mm -hmm. you really get a sense of how people respond to the story ideas that you have um it's probably more beneficial for writers uh and actors um and directors and maybe even picture editors than it might necessarily be for me i don't 
I don't get to shape the uh, direction of the story as much as those fields get. I accent and bring a realism to the story as a sound person. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm sort of guided by what's already there. Uh, Dungeons and Dragons has, you know, a very loose blueprint, but then chaos ensues because you inject a person who's got their own ideas into the game and, you know, your storytelling can go off the rails real fast. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so it's a, it's a lot of fun and it, and it definitely does, um, you know, I never stopped wanting to direct or wanting to write uh and so like that's a a great outlet for that um that side of me getting to do that yeah um and it's also something like you said you can share with your kids um yeah so uh super oh, yeah cool. and my kid's obsessed with it uh <laughs> she plays four times a week um <laughs> yeah way more than i have time to handle yeah those are the days right um, yes yeah no i think it's fun too it's like the ultimate like character building and storytelling um so i always encourage it just to from that aspect um just to get deeper in that yeah i really i thought i kind of tell myself if i was ever going to you know get back into writing more seriously that i would actually like try to make a campaign a D campaign out of my writing and have people come in and role play those characters because you find them going to directions and really find the places where um, you're forcing the issue with mm-hmm. the story um, because the characters are just not getting where you're trying to tell them to go. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I think like it, it's a great way to, um, to practice that part of your craft uh, and to be like, okay, like they're missing a very key component here. What do I need to do to get them on the same page? as me and i think as a writer like that's a really valuable skill to have to know how to guide your your audience where you want them to go yeah no no absolutely um ethan man gosh i wish we had more time we'll just get you a few more questions and then we'll get you out of here but um real quick man uh talk a little bit about um how did you first start at warner brothers because i know people usually that's not their first job like you were saying uh it was a Uh, long day no uh, yeah that was (laughs) um so Novastar, that company that I told you about when I, my first LA job, I worked there for a few years and eventually, uh, they were going out of business. Mm-hmm. Um, and I had a show at the time that I was both supervising and mixing called blue mountain state. Um, and we knew that the company was about to go under and we needed a home for the show. And so, I started taking the show around and I ended up at a company called Tadeo, which at the time was probably the large, one of the largest independent sound companies. And they were doing major, major, major television shows and movies. Like they were a really big deal. Um, you know, the difference between them and a major studio was creatively was not, there wasn't one. Hmm. Um, so I, I, ended up bringing Blue Mountain State there and the people at Tadeo hooked me up um, on a show called Nikita uh, and so I started mixing that um, and Tadeo eventually went under as well uh, and everybody who worked at that company you know scattered so people ended up at Warner Brothers people ended up at Sony Universal um, mm-hmm. a company called Formosa which I do a bunch of where I do minks for uh, and I'm doing pretty little liars for right now um, and one of the people who was running uh, Tadeo also runs Warner Brothers so my shows that I was on um, the flash we were just starting the flash um, we ended up at a company called smart post which is now one of the biggest independent sound companies and like i said in terms of the quality of work that's being done there's or the the kinds of shows that are being done there's not a whole lot of difference between what they do uh and what the major studios are doing as well um so we worked there for a long time um and eventually one of the folks that i knew from tadeo called me uh, and said, Hey, I have an opportunity to work on Riverdale. Would you like to take this job? And, um, I said, yeah, that was something that was really interesting to me. So, um, also because it was a supervising sound editing job where I was, I was exclusively mixing before that. 
Um, and that was a change uh, that I was really excited about. And yeah, getting to work at Warner Brothers and, you know, having an office on the lot, uh, that was pretty awesome. Um, that was kind of the dream, you know, even though I say, like, in terms of the kinds of shows, you know, I was working on major television shows, not being at Warner Brothers. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, you know, 13 year old me, like, definitely had that dream of like getting free access to just wander around a major studio lot like that was that was it i wanted to Mm -hmm. i've always wanted to be in movies and you don't get more iconic than that so i think there was certainly a part of me that was really excited by the prospect of getting to work at warner brothers like oh now now i kind of feel like i made it right a little bit here i mean in in reality that's not true in my head Mm -hmm. You know, as far as the dreamer version of me, that was very true. It, it was great. And they've taken great care of me. And, you know, I've been working for them for the last three years now. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. yeah. No, nah, very cool. Um, and congratulations. Uh, that is something, you know, to really be excited about. Um, and- yeah, it's really cool. And the Riverdale job was also great because we mix on the Paramount lot. So mm-hmm. I get to go bouncing back and forth between, you know, being the cool guy walking around Warner brothers and then going down to Paramount and getting to wander around that lot also. And it's, you know, every day that I get to go to the lot is kind of like this, like very nostalgic. Like I can't believe I get to do this type of thing. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, I kind of had a similar feeling to that. Like, I guess you would say in my mind, um, you know, just being from Virginia, I used to work at Universal Studios as a scare actor and just walking the, hall- nice. yeah, walking the, walking the walk of fame or walk of stars, um, every day to take the subway. It's like, man, you know, that's, you just remind yourself, like, don't ever lose that. Right. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. You were a scare actor there. I had <laughs> one of my favorite moments at Universal Studios involved that. Um, and I really wanted to give the guy a huge tip because uh i took friends of mine from singapore uh to universal studios and we were going through the haunted house and they were terrified the whole way because every <laughs> scare actor just jumped at them mm-hmm. um and it was delightful for me walking behind them just watching <laughs> them shriek every time somebody jumped out and then leatherface jumped out with a chainsaw and they just beelined it for the door and they ran out the door and leatherface ran out the door with them and chased them down the street at universal as they were shrieking. And that might've been the greatest amusement park moment I've ever had was watching (laughs) Leatherface like break, literally break through the fourth wall and chase these poor people down the street. It was amazing. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. And they teach us to do that, by the way. Um, they give us free reign to do that. So, uh, (laughs) it's amazing. That's the best. Uh, yeah. Um, Get into it. Yeah. Um, with that real quick too, has there been any like favorite moments for you throughout uh, your journey, your career, um, that kind of stand out like, Oh my gosh, like that's, I'm, I'm glad I get to do this. Uh, yeah. I mean, anytime I get to see the project in its final form, uh, is, is that, uh, it's, um, you know, you don't, while you're working on it, you don't ever really get to just sit and enjoy the show as a viewer. Um, so like for example minx is airing right now and i watch it every week with my wife and like that's the greatest feeling um to be able to to be able to just sit back and watch the show and know that it's it's having an effect on people in Mm -hmm. some way whether it's entertaining or you know emotional or whatever i like i've gotten to work on a variety of shows that really had that kind of impact and just like every time my wife laughs when we watch the show it's just like yes we got one (laughs) you know um i've had a couple of really special moments a couple years ago um one of my oldest friends from film school made his first feature um uh in indie sci-fi action movie called revolt and uh went to the premiere of that and there was a couple of friends of ours mutual friends of ours from film school who were there and you know we sat in this beautiful theater and it sounded amazing and it looked amazing and it was loud and exciting and uh, it was 
it was just great. And like one of my, our mutual friends from film school, just like we were sitting next to each other. And when the movie ended, he was just like, dude, <laughs> and I was like, yeah, you know, and like, that's always, that was really special. Cause you know, we were 18 year old kids sitting in a dorm room, arguing with each other about movies at one point. And now we argue with each other about our movies. <laughs> um, uh, and that's, that's the best. Um, so yeah, like that's that's a great feeling to know that like we grew up having the same dream and we're living the dream together is really something special. Yeah, that's awesome, man. Thank you again for sharing that. Um, Ethan, last question for you, man, and I ask this to all my guests. Uh, this is for everybody out there. You know, we all need a little hope and inspiration through these really unique times that we're going through still. Um, and that's that's what. Uh, idea thought wish hope prayer whatever it is uh what would you like to leave all the listeners of the way you feel the nation with out there um i think uh that's a i know it's a deep one. yeah <laughs> yeah no it's a I, how to articulate it i mean i think my last answer is kind of is kind of it like the dream is not unattainable um you know, it's not exactly the way I pictured it when I was 12. You know, I thought I'd be the next Spielberg. But mm -hmm. um, I, I, we have this joke when somebody asks how you're doing and it's like, live in the dream. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I joke when I say it, but it's also not untrue. I, I mean, I wake up every morning, I go and I sit in a movie theater all day and I, I play, uh, you know, I that's all I do, you know, I, and it's, it's great. Uh, this is what I've always wanted to do was to be a storyteller and be in the movies in some form. Um, so this was a thing that when I was 13, it was a dream. Um, and it was an inaccessible dream. You know, I had this notion that people who got into the movie industry got plucked out of a crowd you know you always hear the story about the actor who was discovered in an ice cream parlor or whatever by mm -hmm. some random agent like it was not something that i ever thought was accessible to me but my father sent me to a uh, a summer a high school summer film program at in boston at boston university and um suddenly i realized it's like oh you mean like i can i can do this like this is a this is a real job mm -hmm. uh and it's been sort of my life pursuit ever since. And the, and the fact that I get to do it, you know, and people, I, yeah, I, I wish I had a concise way to articulate it other than to be like, you know, the, none of this is unattainable in some form. If there's a, an industry that you're passionate about or a business that you're passionate about, whether it's, you know, sports or filmmaking or theater or music or you know uh, whatever um there's an avenue to be a part of that mm -hmm. um and the industry is a lot less strictly defined than i think you think it is so i would say like if you're really really into something um you know go for it yeah no, I love that. There you have it, folks, from the professional himself. Uh, Ethan, it's been such a pleasure, man. Thank you so much for being here with us. Yeah, thank you for having me. Really appreciate it. Absolutely. Wave Feeler Nation, Tsunami Healing, we are out of here until the next episode.